prefer to speak in English because this is an English book. I don't have the habit of mixing English and Tamil when I speak. But maybe lastly, I can say a few words about Tamil until then you please bear with me. Having said all, I have been forced to only thank and express my gratitude to each and every one of us being here and especially to all comrades and our beloved brothers and our fatherly experts guiding us. There are so many people behind making this book. It is not just only my thought process because this has been, as our brother Prince said, was inspired by my interaction with people. As Paul of Rea, he himself mentioned that he didn't learn his critical pedagogy from anywhere else, but he learned by making a dialogue with the people. And with all exposures and philosophies, that I was exposed to when I was widely traveling across all over the world, living in England and being a professor in the United States and advising ministries and some other bodies throughout the world. I had been asking myself, what is education? It was a long pending cost. So now, we have this book. And once I delivered my speech in Nagapattinam about a couple of months ago at the, at the conference organized by Tamil Nadu Progressive Writers and Artists Association, we declared that we will come out with a weapon. And that weapon is the book and behind this book, there are a lot of conversation I have, I had with Professor Dr. Kotalam, a leading scientist from the United States. He also first translated the book. It was in a traditional uh, Tamil language. And, and Mr. Duraikarno here, he also reviewed the book. The first person who completed the book, read the book, I think is our honorary president, Tamil Nadu Progressive Writers and Artists Association, Mr. Tamil Chal. Because he was the one who asked me through our general secretary a copy of the book that he wants to read. Silently behind the scene, he has been working and giving tasks to every one of us, including me. So now this event is possible because of this association. And there are two leading personalities, Mr. Adhavan Dichanya, the General Secretary of this association, and our brother, Mr. Prince Hajendra Babu. Day and night for the past two months, they have been working on this to make this event a grand success. And we have the publisher who volunteered to publish this book. Mr. Rajan, the editor is here, and Mr. Nagarajan, the, I think the managing director of this publication, also volunteered and supported this cause. And we have a wonderful speakers on the dais, Mr. Prabhat Patnaik, the leading economist, and Professor Anil Sadkopal, a leading economist in India. He has he had developed a pedagogy on his own, and it was implemented in one of the leading states in India. 
long back and Professor Vasanthi Devi and Professor Ramesh Kasekwar, former Vice Chancellor from Pune and Dr. Shakti Rekha and Ms. Deepa and the principal, Professor Raja Samuel, who said that this event must happen here. When we were looking for place outside, but he said that it must happen here, so we have a relevance. I think we are very proud of having this event here, Professor. And there are many people involved and our brother Mani Ratnam also has arrived. There are so many participants who are here to show the solidarity and support this cause. I think I must confess much, myself first. <coughs> the new education policy 2019 had given me a very tough time, a very hard time to me, <coughs> because they gave me only two months to complete this book. I wanted this book to be out before this book, this policy is endorsed in the parliament. <coughs> so within two months, we have to completely read the book, the policy, and respond to it. And uh, I couldn't also accept some offers in my career also because of this. So about three to four months, I stayed back home and, and started working on it. Uh, only after completing this book, I went to Mysore and joined as, you know, take, I have taken this position as Vice Chancellor. But one thing I have to say, there are a lot of, you know, interpretations and expositions given to all of us out of the book and in general what the national education policy had to say to us. So every one of us know what the policy is about. But the problem here is, at the outset I would like to say that the policy makers didn't seem to understand what education, the philosophy of education as it is. Because there is a, a part in the book, I said, if I remember correctly the book, the sentence I wrote, knowingly or unknowingly, the policy makers had dragged liberal education into its recommendation. So I said knowingly or unknowingly, and I answered, this question in the last part of the liberal education chapter. Because liberal education is not an easy uh, task to be contained in some uh, quantifiable or in a narrowed fashion. It is a very big, a wider, it has its wider perspectives. Liberal education is something which trains mind to think. So when one is involved in getting the training, in, in, in training the mind, they will be able to know what the truth is. But to know the truth, they have to go wider beyond the domains they study. Say if they study physics, chemistry, whatsoever, the disciplinary educational approach. Beyond this approach, they have to go wider and study all aspects of the knowledge the domain that they study. So that means the curriculum should have the flexibility. The curriculum should have an open-ended approach where the contents, the subject matters of instruction should be properly laid out, should have an open-ended approach so that the learner can go wider and study the society and study all relevant peripheral issues and they can come out with uh, the understanding on the subject that they study. So this is the <coughs> philosophy of liberal education. So when they go into study the liberal education, 
they have to critically think, they have to critically review, they have to critically question all the challenges, the questions, the challenges, the problems, the doubts being face, facing the society or facing the learner. So that means the curriculum should be flexible enough, wider enough. That is why liberal education had come in the offer. But even now, those who had brought the concept of liberal education in the Western world are struggling now because it also has its own negative consequences. But one thing I have to say at the outset, this policy has to be outrightly rejected. It has to be, it faces, it qualifies an outright rejection because the justification is made in the book. This book, as our prince said, is not mainly responding the policy, but it comes out with the definition of the, 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 the process of education, the philosophy of education. It defines with respect to the kind of the society we have. Education is society driven. Education is a social function. That is why I said that society driven education must be there, not the nationalistic education. The reason is, nation is good if the notion of all people are reflected in nation building. In the way in which the nation grows, evolves, it must be able to reflect all aspects, all aspirations of the people, the aspirations of all people, all segments of the society, the likes, the dislikes, the wants, the requirements, and the problems, the challenges, all should be reflected in nation building. Only then the nation is going to serve back to the society. Otherwise that nation will be serving only those who had defined the nation. That means a nation is a notion of the people. If the notion is unsegregated, if the notion is aggregated, is the, if the notion is an aggregative process of all notions of all segments of the society, then it will fulfill the aim of the notion, nation. Otherwise, that nation is not going to do anything to the members of, this, uh, of the nation. So that means it is very hard to believe or understand the concept of nation because the nation always, when we accept, it will always be built on nationalism. What is nationalism then? Nationalism is nothing but a state of mind. A state of mind that this is my nation, this is my identity, this is my language, this is my culture, and this is my value. This is collectively what is represented as nation. Nationalism, what makes the nation. So that means this nationalism must be, rep, must be able to represent all walks of life. Otherwise, it is not a nation. Now, our Professor Anil, in his speech, said that the nationalism is working against a nation. That is true. Because this nationalism that what we have, like Hindutva, whatsoever they are calling now, is working against the nation itself. It is making its own grave. So that means the nationalism should be cautiously received and understood by the members of the society. Otherwise we are going to lose. We cannot, it is not, it is not, you know, a reversible if we lose now. Whoever said nation had used nationalism to maintain the status quo of the society, of those in the helm of the affairs of the society, those at the helm of the affairs of the nation, those at the helm of the affairs of the society or those at the upper levels of the social strata, the upper, upper communities. Those at the helm of the affairs of the, of the nation are the rulers of the nation. So that means there is a collusion between the rulers and those having this social authority. 
So these people are including with each other and trying to, you know, voice their interest. So that is what nationalism is about. Always nationalism will be driven by or defined by the specially cultivated group, by the specially cultivated community. In any nation, because we have caste system, a hierarchically degraded you know, caste system we have, social structure we have, it may not have in other parts of the world. In the United States, it's something different. Or in Western other countries, the social structure is something different. It is economically driven. Sometimes it is, you know, racially driven. Sometimes it is socially driven. Ours is socially driven. The upper caste, lower caste, middle caste, and so on. So that means, this nationalism, whoever wanted to get the status quo, both in the society or at the nation building, will always use nationalism. That has been the history. That is what this book says. What Hitler did, what Mussolini did, is what our current government is trying to do. Mussolini said, Italian it too. Romani too. That means Italian pride. And Hitler said German pride. Racial purity. That is what Nazism is about. So when he said German pride, and Mussolini said Italian pride, our, I think the, the new education policy, in its vision statement says Indian pride. Could you notice the similarities between all three? The Indian pride is, as Professor said, the Hindutva or the, our knowledge, Indian knowledge system, our Indian heroes like Aryabhata, these, that, and so on, and our precious culture, our value system. These are all the national pride the policy talks about. So that means they want to inculcate this national pride into everyone's mind. That's why they want to have early childhood education at the age of three. Of course, everyone knows from three years to eight years, everyone knows that the brain grows very fast. That means the child is able to you know, absorb things very quickly. It can learn. That is why they want to inculcate this Indian pride, the so-called their version of Indian pride into this child children. They want to have early education at starting at the eight, three years old. And this nationalism is always a problem to majority of the pro, uh, majority of the people of the country. So most of the, the, the countries, you know, around in the past three, 300 years, if you look at the evolution of the educational process, they always try to use nationalism, the national agenda first. So when you put the national agenda, when the national agenda is defined by the specially cultivated class of the society, which is a micro minority everywhere, then how can we expect that that is going to serve all other communities, the majority communities? So this has been the problem of nationalism. So nationalism, one started for patriotism, one started for collectivism, a collective representation of all people. Now it has been misused in the interest of the very micro minority, specially cultivated groups or caste or communities. So that is the danger we are facing. So now I have to justify because this has been a confusion always, as Professor Vasundi Devi said, against between the dichotomous relationship or differences between nationalistic education and society-driven education. I always told you, tell you in many people, in many conferences, a nation is a notion. A nation can emerge, can disappear, can merge, can split, can be divided at, in due course of time. As Soviet Russia, our, 
you know, just collapsed about three decades ago. And Czechoslovakia here. And many countries come together, merge, or divide based on the notion of the people. If the people's notion is a united India, yes, it will be united India. If the people's notion is not united India, then it will be different countries there. So this is a warning to the nation builders, the nationalists. If they try to inculcate the micro-minority interest into everyone's head, then they will face this question. The nation will be heading towards disintegration. That means education has been the tool to divide or merge or unite or disintegrate a nation. So that means education is a highly sensitive issue. We have to know, the leaders have to know, the policy makers have to know how to handle this. It's a very, very highly sensitive issue. We cannot play around with nationalism, actually. So as I said, nation is a transient thing. A nation, the concept of nation is a transient matter. It is not a permanent thing. That's why I said this 80 years ago, Soviet Russia, they wanted Soviet Russia, a united Soviet Russia. After 60 years, the same people thought that it must be a disintegrated Russia. It was no longer a Soviet Russia. So it is a notion of the people. It is the likes of the people. It is the dislikes of the people. So the nation will always reflect the likes, dislikes, and aspirations of the people. So that is how nations are built. Nations collapse. So that means nation is, nationalism is always a temporary thing. It's not a permanent matter. But what is permanent is society. Society used to have 3,000 years of, or 5,000 since in time immemorial. It used to have a learning curve. Why we are talking about Tiruvalluva after 2,000 years? Why we are talking about Tolkapia after 2,500 years? It's the learning curve of the society. Why we are talking about Buddha after 2,500 years? It is a learning curve. That is the society. It is a permanent thing. Society is a permanent thing. It is not transient. It will be upgrading itself. It will evolve. It will transform towards the better position or worst position. But society is permanent. That is why education has to be built upon the society, not upon nationalism or nation. This is a very important concept. Sometimes people will come to you and tell you, oh, come on, nation is ours. Nationalism is a nation pride and patriotism, all those things. They will try to inculcate our interest, dragged towards them. But we should be very much careful what nationalism is about and what society is about. Society is our life. It is our identity. It is our language. It is our tradition. It is our value. At the cost of our value system, our language, our culture, our tradition, if nationalism interferes into our evolution, we must resist. Otherwise, we will lose everything. Everything. We will lose our identity. We lose our economy. We will lose our culture. Everything. Why I am saying always, I am not jingoistic. <coughs> Being a Tamilian, I am not a jingoistic Tamilian. I am a rationalistic Tamilian, not a jingoistic Tamilian. I always use Tamil culture or our Tamil tradition only rationally. There are also some bitter elements there in our culture also. Because our people are also following the, the so-called the caste-ridden, you know, things. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm opposing it. There are better parts of my culture that I can heed to, I can take proud of. But it is not jingoism because the culture, the tradition, the value, everything will give us life, livelihood and opportunities. I mean economic opportunities. That is why I am saying society driven education is not only going to enlighten us through a quality education, not only going to you know, give us 
the ability, the skills and knowledge necessary to face the changing world. Not only is going to help us in changing or facing the highly technologically driven world, our fourth industrial revolution is coming towards us. So we have to be better prepared. But how? But my culture will give me food. If the culture, my value and my language and my traditions are incorporated. That is what I collectively say indigenous knowledge system. The indigenous knowledge system must be able to improve itself. It must be protected. But the indigenous knowledge system should also be able to incorporate the global knowledge system so that the global knowledge, if it is relevant and if it is good for me, it should be domesticated within the indigenous knowledge system so that my knowledge system will be upgraded. That is the best knowledge system. That is the stable knowledge system. Education should be able to stabilize my indigenous knowledge system, not destroying my indigenous knowledge system. That is what society-driven education is about. It must stabilize. Say, for instance, about 20, 30 years ago, I was able to eat parayasoru. Parayasoru. About 20, 30 years ago, when I was a kid studying in school. But now I'm not able to eat it. But now, those days people said, okay, you eat chapati and puri, parota, all those things, very modern food, those days, 30 days, 30 years ago. And whoever ate parayasoru were discouraged. I think most of us would have, you know, followed it. I think practice sensed it. But now I'm not able to get parayasoru. But somebody is making my parayasoru in the United States and making and selling the food, making money out of it. Is it not my culture? Is it not my host, uh, human experience? Knowledge is nothing but human experience. Whatever the things that we do in laboratories are in four walls inside the school is not only knowledge because these are practicing the knowledge. What is, what is being done in universities and schools are practicing the knowledge. The knowledge is outside. Human experience is the knowledge. So that means education should be able to collectively you know, cultivate, collectively consume the human experience. Then the knowledge becomes full. Then it is relevant to my society, to, to relevant to, me, to the learner. So this is how education should imbibe or cultivate or receive the ideas, the human experience, the knowledge from the society. So educational process should be like an osmosis between on one hand the society, on the other hand the formal, formal education system. So it, it must have, you know, forth and back, a transaction of the knowledge, you know, sharing mechanisms between education and the society, the educational process and the society. Only then, my education will be relevant to me. Only then, the knowledge that I gain from the formal education will be relevant to me. This is what society-driven education is about. 